Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robert Smith, and my industry project is on underground cable rejuvenation technologies done in collaboration with PPL Electric Utilities. So first, I just want to give you an outline of the things I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first is I'm going to cover the uh, project scope and schedule for this project, and then I'll go into a little bit into the underground cable um, structure and the mechanisms that can cause damage, namely water trees. And I'm going to how we can, re we can repair this damage using underground cable rejuvenation technologies and then look at two specific examples, namely UPR, which is unsustained pressure rejuvenation, and SPR, which is sustained pressure rejuvenation. We'll go into a little bit of the economics of these two technologies and then finish with a discussion and future work. Uh, so first off, the project scope, uh, the, the main part of the project scope is analyzing these technologies based on their effectiveness and methodology. The second main uh, part of the scope is to uh, build and develop pre and post testing procedures for rejuvenated cables to make sure first that the cables that we are rejuvenating uh, are potential candidates, means that um, they're not going to rejuvenate and they fail anyways. And also that once they are rejuvenated, the post tests indicate that they've been rejuvenated effectively. And the last part is uh, developing a business case, looking at the economics of cable rejuvenation and looking at the impact of customer outages in the event that a rejuvenated cable fails. The first part of the technology analysis was completed in the fall and the pre and post testing procedures and the business model are being developed currently. So first, let's try to provide a little motivation of why we want to rejuvenate cables in the first place. A lot of the cables in the ground today were installed in the 70s, eight, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they had XLP insulation or cross-linked polyethylene. During this time period, they were manufactured using a steam curing process, which introduced water and ionic impurities into the insulation. Uh, ideally, the insulation is hydrophobic, meaning that it likes to repel water, and it's not very attractive. However, uh, in a manufacturing process, nothing's perfect, and you have voids and defects in the insulation. This, combined with the water and an, alter an alternating field or uh, some type of strong electric field, is kind of the perfect storm for these things called water trees. A water tree forms, begins to form at one of these defects or these initiation points. One of these initi ini initiation points are um, they're hydrophilic, means that they like to attract water instead of being hydrophobic, hydrophobic like normal insulation. So at these initiation points, this water is attracted. The strong electric field disassociates the water and its ionic impurities, and these degrade the dielectric properties of the insulation at this point, creating a more hydrophobic, uh, hydrophilic region, attracting more water, which is then disassociated, and thus you have this propagating effect of this degradation in the in the insulation. So here on the left, you have uh, a water tree that was initiated on the uh, outer region of the insulation propagating inwards. And on your right, we have a vented water tree that has an electric tree. An electric tree develops uh, during the event of a partial discharge. This occurs when the insulation has been de uh, degraded substantially and is a sign of imminent failure. So the way we can uh, fix these cables is we can, one, replace them, but replacement is extremely capital intensive and we have to figure out the logistical issues and shifting loads to other lines and digging up and replacing uh, the cable. Or you can re rejuvenate them. And this is kind of the main motivating factor why we want to do cable rejuvenation. Uh, cable rejuvenation started in the mid-1980s in response to the discovery of this water treatment occurring in these cables. It is essentially uh, the injection of a silicone-based fluid down the conductor strands through the interstitial spaces of the conductor under pressure. During this time, the fluid flows through the conductor and into the insulation, into these water trees, where the injection formulation of the injection fluid overrises or essentially combines with the water, resulting in an overall larger molecule. Thus, we're getting rid of the water in the water tree, and we have larger molecules overall that repair the dielectric strength of the cable. The first step in cable rejuvenation is first you take the cable out of service, you ground it, and you do some pre-testing. The first pre-test you do is TDR, time domain reflectometry, to make sure that there's if there's any splices in the cable, because splice cables are treated differently than regular cables. 
And then you do air pressure testing to verify that the cable can support rejuvenation or fluid flow throughout the length of the cable. And lastly, you check the movement of the cable to make sure that when you put the cable back into service, it's not going to fail due to neutral corrosion. If a cable passes these tests, you can do uh, fluid injection, and so you add uh, injection adapters to the ends of the cable. Here on the left, we have a dead front termination where the three uh, termination adapters have an injection port on the back of the adapters to allow fluid to flow into the end of the cable. And you see the, the two feed tanks. And then on the right, in a uh, live front termination, we have the injection port that switch to the conductor using uh, heat shrinkable rubber and hose clamps to make sure that the injection port does not separate from the conductor under pressure. And once again, you see the, uh, the pressurized tank with a silicone-based fluid. And in that case, they're using helium as the medium to push the fluid. So after the injection is, um, after you add, you add the equipment onto the system and you do the injection, the injection uh, varies in time depending on the type of technology used. And after the, uh, the cable is deemed to be rejuvenated, the equipment is removed and the cable is placed back into service. Now, as I mentioned before, there are two main technologies we were looking at, unsustained pressure rejuvenation and sustained pressure rejuvenation. On the left, we have uh, conductor size, small and large conductors. The characteristics of the rejuvenation technology vary slightly with respect to the conductor size. And then we have the rejuvenation variables. So let's first consider UPR. UPR requires three visits. The first visit is where you go out, test the cable, if it's a good candidate. You hook up the injection equipment and do a moderate pressure injection. And then the second visit, you attach a low pressure feed tanks. And these low pressure feed tanks will feed this cable between 60 and 120 days. So you have a prolonged rejuvenation period. And then the third visit is to remove all of the equipment from the site and put the cable back into service. So we have a, a prolonged soap period. The dielectric recovery, even after this soap period, is up to two years. And with UPR technology, is up to 20-year uh, warranty. With respect to SPR, we only have one visit, and this is because of the shortened duration of the, uh, the injection period or the soap period, which is typically less than a day. So the cable is not energized. You, you uh, come in, test the cable, inject it, and put it back in service all in one visit. Furthermore, it has a superior dielectric recovery of about a week, and depending on the injection fluid used with this technology, it can last anywhere from 25 to 40 years. With the larger conductor, we have slightly better characteristics with UPR. We reduce the number of visits by one. Uh, however, the dielectric recovery is still 24 months. The warranty is still 20 years. But we also do have a reduced soap period of 30 minutes to 30 hours, so it is comparable to SPR for larger conductors. So this was kind of the basis of the technology analysis I did last semester. This semester I started doing some of the preliminary economics. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail because I still want to give you guys a reason to come over and talk to me uh, after we do this. So I'll just kind of skim over this. Uh, uh, using cost quotes for UPR and SPR technology, we use the weighted average cost of capital to, as a discount factor during, for the NPV calculation. As a result, we, we had a return on investment of the UPR technology of 20% and a ROI of SPR technology of 33%. And furthermore, injection or rejuvenation of these cables is only about half the cost of replacement, so you can rejuvenate twice as many feet of cable as you can replace it, providing a greater motivating factor. So overall, both of these technologies have failure rates of less than 1%. However, uh, major differences include injection duration, dielectric recovery, and the warranty length. The vendors of UPR technology say that you need that prolonged rejuvenation for that prolonged soak period due to the, the variable uh, cable characteristics, but it doesn't appear that that is necessarily the case. And lastly, SPR has superior attrib attributes in terms of uh, injection characteristics and a better ROI. Some future work that I'm going to be doing for myself is looking at the pre and post testing rejuvenation procedures as I mentioned earlier 
to uh, quantify the impact of customer outages in the event that a rejuvenated cable fails. With SPR technology, you have a warranty of 40 years. However, none of these cables have been in service for 40 years. The longest is about 10. So it's important to try to quantify and look at what is the impact on customers if one of these rejuvenated cables fail. And lastly, to compare rejuvenation to replacement in terms of their cost and uh, effectiveness or their performance. As I mentioned before, I did a little bit of the, uh, the economic analysis, but it's also important to look at the performance metrics of, of the two cases. And for a future student, there could be some type of PPL pilot study to do uh, re rejuvenating some cables using SPR, rejuvenating other cables using SPR, and looking at the results. With that being said, thank you for your time and your attention. Are there any questions? Sorry if you said this in the beginning, but sure. is this done on a condition base, basis or a time basis? I mean, you got to do the maintenance, you're doing it, you've already got some information to tell you this cable has to be ready to fail, or are you just doing it because it's 20 years old? And it's yeah, I, I don't think there's that there's any type of conditional assessment done with cables. I think it's more of a time basis. And that's why I think it's important to really develop testing procedures that really accurately look at where these water trees are, if there are any, and the severity of the degradation. Just to answer that a little bit, there had been some uh, testing or some of this work kind of work that was done at PPL over the years based on how many times it came to the Okay. And, uh, but I don't know how much that, what those criteria were, but there was some criteria for that. My question for you was sure. just, you said this has been going on since the 80s. I just wonder, do we, is there any data in the industry to indicate how effective it is over time? You know, are these cables still working well today? And, uh, or have they failed due to more treating or, or other factors? The rejuvenation? Yeah. Um, for the company that provides UPR technology, it's very difficult to get an idea of the likelihood of these cables to fail. They're not very, um, they, they really don't like to reveal that information, of course. Um, from, from what I can tell and from the, the research I've done, it's less than 1% with uh, the company that produces the SPR technology. They actively uh, reveal how often their cables fail, and typically right now it's less than half a percent. Uh, not that I know of. Uh, that's that's a great question. So the, the warranty period is 40 years, so ideally it's supposed to last the, the duration of the cable. I imagine that if a company has a rejuvenated cable and it fails, the last thing that they want to do is rejuvenate it again. Um, the, company that, the company that uses the SPR technology will re-inject cables that use the UPR technology. However, I don't think it's uh, the other way around. I don't think UPR technology will re-inject SPR technology. Is that the question? Thank you very much.